switching between self states, pseudo identities, sub personalities, ego states, never mind what you call them. <laughs> switching is a common phenomenon in dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder, although it's not a single disorder, it's a family. It is also common in borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and in my humble or not so humble opinion, antisocial personality disorder, aka psychopathy in the most extreme and malignant cases. Switching, anyone who has witnessed switching in a borderline or a narcissist will never forget it. It is a terrifying experience. No wonder some people use terms like possessions, possession or demons <laughs> to describe what's happening. The switch can be abrupt, um, it could be sudden, it could be unexpected, it could be ostensibly untriggered for no reason, or the switch could be gradual, incremental. But at any rate, it is discernible, it's visible. I'm going to teach you the signs and how to tell that a switching event is about to take place. But I repeat, anyone who is witness switching in a borderline or a narcissist will never forget it. The change in body posture, the new personality that takes over, behaviors which are hitherto unprecedented, unexpected temper tantrums, narcissistic rage, or on the very contrary, an eerie calm, acting out, recklessness, crazy making, drama, all these are typical of switching. Switching is a major regulatory mechanism in borderline personality disorder and in narcissistic personality disorder. And this is the topic of today's video lecture. And here I am about to switch on you <laughs> to Sam Vaknin, the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. And in my switch, switched identity as a professor of psychology uh, in SIAPS, Commonwealth Institute for Advanced Professional Studies and formerly in Southern Federal University as a visiting professor. Okay, credentials aside, let us delve right into the maelstrom of the switching phenomenon in borderline and narcissism. The entire video was triggered by a comment that I've received on one of my YouTube videos. One of a few comments I haven't deleted. And it said, are there known signs of women with BPD, borderline personality disorder, of how they are or were before and when they committed suicide, compared to those who have not or don't, especially during the holidays? Suicide, of course, is a form of acting in rather than direct, direct aggression outwards. Aggression is directed inwards and becomes self-destructive to the extreme. Suicide is acting in, but it is also coupled with acting out. So it's the equivalent of a temper tantrum writ large. <laughs> acting in because, of course, it destroys the object of frustration, which is the person with BB BPD, but acting out because it punishes everyone around the, the borderline person. Mother, father, siblings, friends, they're devastated in the wake of a suicide. So it's a way to punish people. It's a, for, it's a way to act out against people, even as the borderline person destroys herself in the process. So it's a very unique combination of acting out and acting in, together with internalized aggression and externalized aggression. Suicide as self-punitive, and other punitive, generally a punitive measure. Suicide, though, is preceded by switching. Before the borderline person commits suicide, she switches to another self-state known as secondary psychopathy. Before the narcissistic person becomes self-destructive, the, before the narcissist destroys everything around him, everyone around him, his life, his accomplishments, and ends badly before he does any of this, which is the equivalent of suicide in narcissistic personality disorder, 
there is a process of switching. The borderline switches to a secondary psychopathic self-state, and the narcissist, ironically, switches to a borderline organization self-state. Let's put, let's translate this into English. The borderline is prone to suicide. About 11% of people with borderline personality disorder commit suicide before she commits suicide. I'm using she, it's of course a he, he is a she. Gender pronouns in this lecture are totally interchangeable. About half of all people diagnosed with borderline are men, and half of all people diagnosed with narcissism are women. So before she switches, before she commits suicide, I'm sorry, the borderline switches into a secondary psychopathic self-state, and then she becomes extremely violent. And this violent is self-directed and other-directed. Suicide is used as a tool, as a weapon. Suicide is weaponized against the borderline's nearest and dearest. It's their punishment. Similarly, when the narcissist, for example, is mortified or under tremendous stress or repeatedly narcissistically injured or collapses, fails to obtain narcissistic supply uh, over a long period of time, the narcissist switches. He switches into a borderline state. He becomes emotionally dysregulated, reckless, and he tends to act out. The narcissist becomes a borderline, the borderline becomes a psychopath. And this becoming, this process of becoming, is what is known as switching. One last comment before I describe the phenomenon itself. Both people with borderline personality disorder and people with narcissistic personality disorder are prone to switching because they are very acquainted with and they often use the defense mechanism of splitting and self-splitting. These are defenses, infantile, immature, childish, baby defenses that have survived in their initial primordial form in the adult. So borderlines and narcissists tend to split people. People are all bad or all good. Situations are all black or all white. Something is all good or all evil. This is known as dichotomous thinking, splitting the world, splitting everyone in the world. And the splitting is not permanent. Today you could be all good, and tomorrow you disagreed with a narcissist, or you had a fight with a borderline, and you become all bad. But at any rate, you're bound to be all good or all bad. There's nothing in between. You're never going to be gray. There's never gray. There are no shades of gray in the borderline and narcissist world. This is the, the splitting defense. There's another derivative defense, self-splitting. The same way the narcissist and the borderline split other people, they split themselves. The borderline sometimes feels that she's all good and sometimes feels that she's all bad. The narcissist feels that he's invincible and omnipotent and omniscient and godlike. And then he could have a period where he feels ruined and collapsed and a loser and a failure and inferior. So this is a form of self-splitting. And of course, self-splitting is possible because both the borderline and the narcissist do not possess a core identity. They don't have a stable self, constellated, integrated, always there, consistent. They don't have a self. They are selfless <laughs> in a way. And this is known as identity disturbance. When you have an identity disturbance, when your identity is not, is not uh, let's say, stable over the lifespan, when your identity changes on a dime and from day to day, and in response to cues from the environment and from others, when you don't have a constellated um, self, when you don't have an integrated ego, when all you have is an emptiness inside you, when you're nothing but a void, or a black hole, an empty schiz schizoid core, then you're constantly in flux. You are reactive to the, to the outside, to the environment, because you don't exist. You become the outcome of other people's opinions about you, other people's actions, other people's choices determine who you are, other people's decision-making push you to and fro, like a cork on ocean waves. So 
this flotsam and jetsam existence of the narcissist and borderline, the lack of a stable, integrated core identity, the constant use of splitting defenses against other people and against themselves, all this prepares the ground for switching. Switching is essentially, as the name implies, a transition from one state to another and back, back and forth. And this is possible if you can simultaneously harbor or include in your mind two states, three states, six states. And you can do this only if you don't have a unitary self and if you constantly split. So these are the psychodynamic or psychological foundation, foundations of switching. Now, switching occurs in borderlines and narcissists when they are confronted with a threat, when they are threatened, but also when they are confronted with a promise, for example, intimacy. Both borderlines and narcissists perceive good things, such as love, such as intimacy, as threats. What you would regard as a promising thing, something to look forward to, a reason to get up in the morning and to enjoy life, narcissists and borderlines would regard as imminent looming menace. Because in the narcissist and borderlines life, there's never been a happy ending. Everything ended badly. Every promise was broke, broken. Every intimacy violated. Every love ended in hurt and pain. So they've learned to associate positive things with negative outcomes. And consequently, they react identically to promises and threats. And so these promises and threats can provoke switching. So ironically, when the borderline, for example, is faced with a wonderful partner who is proposing to her and, you know, she's about to start a great life together and to graduate and to have a career. And when things go extremely well, she's likely to switch and destroy everything. So same with the narcissist. It's a form of asserting control. Things are going to end badly, but on my terms and conditions. I'm going to make them end badly. I'm in control of this process. I'm making it happen. So this is not happening to me, but I'm making it happen. And so uh, threats and promises. These threats and promises can be real. They can be imaginary. They can be anticipated. They can even be recalled figments of memory. So some memories can trigger switching. This is erroneously known as emotional flashbacks. Flashback occurs only in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. There is no such thing as emotional uh, flashback. It's a nonsensical juxtaposition, juxtaposition of two words. There's no such thing clinically. We don't teach it in any university. This is rank nonsense. However, it is true that recalled situations, emotions in memory, can trigger switching. And so these are, this is the background, this is the landscape that provokes, provokes switching in borderlines and narcissists. Switching, in other words, is responsive to real or anticipated or imaginary or recalled environmental cues. The borderline and the narcissist switch in reaction to stress, anxieties, such as separation insecurity, also known as abandonment anxiety or engulfment anxiety, substance abuse, medication, holidays, important events, life crisis, traumas, new people, crowds, mortification, and so on. All these can and very often do trigger switching. Even sensor, sensory inputs, smells, sights, sounds can provoke switching. Indeed, one of the uh, one of the great biggest, at least in terms of number of pages, one of the greatest documentations of switching is Marcel Proust's work, Remembrance of Things Past. The book 
which is, I think, the largest, I think it's 3,000 pages, the largest book ever written. The book starts with a smell. The protagonist of the book passes near a house and there's a smell wafting out of the house, the smell of a specific type of cookie. And this provokes an avalanche of memories. And there is a great description of switching. And throughout the book, there are multiple occasions of switching, expertly described by the amazing Proust, who spent most of his life in bed consumed by tuberculosis and possibly hypochondriasis and other mental health disorders. So we have established by now that switching is essentially a splitting defense, self-directed, self-splitting, it's a form of self-splitting. Splitting. It is a reaction to perceived, real, imaginary, anticipated, recalled, threat, or promise, because borderlines and narcissists perceive promises as threat. And we also understood that switching is utterly triggered by events outside the borderline in the narcissist, in the outside world, external events in the environment. We call these environmental cues. Okay. Now, switching, as I said, is very visible, very discernible. By the end of this lecture, if you listen carefully and survive it, you'll be able to tell when a narcissist or a borderline is about to switch. It is Switching is preceded by a period of emotional dysregulation. Now, this period could be as brief as, as 10 seconds, or it could be as long as 10 months. But there's always emotional dysregulation which precedes the switching. This has been first described by Hauben, H-O-U-B-E-N, and he coined the phrase emotional switching. So there's always emotional dysregulation. Suddenly, there are speech acts, behaviors, body language, micro expressions, facial expressions, uh, crying, screaming. Suddenly, there are behaviors indicative of emotions which overwhelm the defenses of the narcissist and the borderline, emotions which create a clinical process known as decompensation. The defenses are deactivated. And the borderline and the narcissist remain face-to-face -face in direct contact with reality, external reality in the case of the borderline, internal reality in the case of the narcissist, his shame, his reservoir of shame and guilt and rage early childhood um, repository. So emotional dysregulation. It's very easy to tell emotional dysregulation because emotional dysregulation in the vast majority of cases is somehow externalized. Um, the borderline will suddenly cry, weep, weep or cry. She will crumble. The narcissist would throw a temper tantrum. Um, both of them would mumble and um, and become paranoid. Um, they would both begin to talk about dying or suicide. And so emotional dysregulation is very easy to spot. Um, I mean, you need to be seriously obtuse and insensitive to not notice emotional dysregulation. And the typical reaction is, what has happened, dear? Why are you like that? What's wrong? So if you if you suddenly find yourself in a situation where you want to ask, you feel compelled to ask the borderline or the narcissist, what's wrong, dear? Or what's wrong, not dear? Then you're faced with emotional dysregulation. Now, emotional dysregulation precedes switching. And this is a phase known as emotional switching. And then there are three types of switching. Consensual switching, forced switching, and triggered switching. I will explain the difference. Now, these terms are borrowed from the study of DID, dissociative identity disorder, where switching is the regulatory mechanism among the various personality segments or figments known as alters. So, consensual switching is when the switching is anticipated. 
so that the borderline knows, for example, tomorrow I'm going for an exam at school, I'm not prepared, I'm highly stressed, I'm highly anxious, and she knows that switching is about to occur. She knows she's going to switch. She knows she's going to switch to a secondary psychopath. Similarly, a narcissist is faced with a public speaking engagement and he knows that he's not prepared or he knows that his enemies and detractors are in the crowd, in the audience. He anticipates bad things, a failure, public humiliation, mortification. So he steals himself, he prepares himself for this eventuality and he knows that he's going to switch. He knows he's going to become a temporary or transient borderline. So when the borderline and the narcissist realize in advance that they're going to switch because they anticipate anxiety, that is known as consensual switching. Another type of switching is forced switching. Forced switching is when there is a war, a conflict, a battle between self-states within the borderline and the narcissist. Now remember that in Philip Bromberg's work on self-states, as extended by myself, <laughs> by your humble servant, so in this theory of self-states, mental illness is when the regulatory mechanism, the allocative mechanism, the mechanism that allocates resources between self-states is defun defunct or deficient or problematic or dysfunctional. So the self-states compete for resources. They're all active simultaneously and they compete for resources. That's a, a definition of mental illness in the self-states, in my self-states work. So forced switching is when several self-states compete for dominance in a specific environment or under certain circumstances or in reaction to situations, triggers and cues and provocations. So they compete and there's a battle going on, a war going on. And in this particular case of force switching, you are likely to see in the borderline and the narcissist elements of each self-state appearing for a brief minute, moment and vanishing. And then another, another self-state emerges. And the, the new self-state, the second, uh, second self-state, can be diametrically opposed to the first self-state. So you see kind of a, uh, a whirlwind, a tornado, a hurricane of, of self-states in a mixer. <laughs> and, and the narcissist and, the, and, the, and or the borderline, they actually switch between multiple self-states within minutes. It's an, it's an extremely disorienting experience to the observer because you can't tell who, who are you faced with, who are you talking to. And finally, the, the conflict is resolved and one of the more dominant self-states take over, takes over and the narcissist and the borderline settle. So switching ends, forced switching ends in settlement, settled switching. So at that point, one self-state is evident and observable. But the, again, in forced switching, this is preceded by a period where multiple self-states manifest, are expressed, are visible and discernible, observable. And again, this is extremely disorienting. And the final, the final type of, uh, the third type, of switching is the triggered switching. It's when, as I said, triggers in the environment, cues, messaging, signaling, uh, events, uh, including memories, anticipation, anxieties, internal cues and external cues trigger the switching. The switching in this particular case is essentially a defense constellation or a def constellation of defense mechanism. And there's a self-state that is best suited to respond to the challenges of the new environment or the new person in the borderlines and narcissist life or the crowds or the challenge or whatever, mortification or whatever, and this self-state takes over, but it is triggered from the outside. So consensual switching 
is triggered from the inside owing to anticipation of challenging events or you know stress or anxiety forced force switching is internal battle between self states that has to do with a change in the environment so the battle is triggered but not any specific self state triggered switching is when the environment triggers a specific self state there's no conflict there's no battle there's no argument it's clear that this specific self state is best for this uh, new environment these are the three types of switching but what are the signs of switching switching exactly like psychosis is preceded by a prodromal phase prodromal phase prodromal phase is just a fancy way of saying the phase that precedes the switching itself and it is a this, at this phase, at this stage, that you can observe signs, harbingers, red alerts, warning, warnings that switching is about to occur. Number one, a rigid body posture. The body becomes almost catatonic. There is strong muscle tonus. There is a very stilted type of motion so there is a sensory motoric impairment and this could lead to pseudo fainting kind of loss of consciousness or at least the dislocation or um, instability physical instability so something in the body and the body uh, it's a reaction that is very similar to the way we react to a threat it's like a deer in the headlights. The, it's as if the borderline of the narcissist who are about to switch freeze because they perceive it as a threat. And so rigid body posture could, uh, could um, culminate in pseudo fainting, loss of consciousness, uh, momentary loss of consciousness. The next sign is calm before the storm, an eerie calm, a menacing, ominous calm. A little like in a horror movie, you know, when we know something bad is going to happen. And it's just the music that cues us into this. The music informs us that something horrible is going to happen. So there's this calm before the storm, the eye of the cyclone. And behavior changes. The borderline and the narcissist, during this calm period, during this calm period, they are atypically kind, reasonable even submissive they're averse to conflict they say yes to everything they don't react to criticism or disagreement or even abuse in any way um, and it's as if they have changed and became normal healthy or even i would say codependent and people pleasers and this is extremely eerie very creepy because it is uh it is a polar change. It is a, 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 a rad radical, dramatic transformation. It doesn't last, of course. It's just a sign of imminent, looming switching. But this phase is always there. When you see the narcissist and the borderline, calm, pacified, reasonable, consensus-seeking, submissive, conflict-averse, kind, nice, compassionate, affectionate, empathic, one would say, something's wrong, they're about to switch. Next, the next sign is changes in body self-image, somatoform changes. So the narcissist and borderline are likely to suddenly begin to dissect their bodies, to analyze their bodies. They're going to say, I've gained a lot of weight, I'm too fat, I'm too this, I'm, I'm sick. I'm having palpitations, I'm, I'm uh, over sweating, I can't sleep. So they begin to emphasize their bodies. They, what they're doing is actually they're somatizing. They're somatizing the stress and the anxiety and the adverse environmental cues. They're using their bodies to express the pending looming trauma. This is van der Kolk's work and uh, Gabo Mattes to some extent. So 
there's a change, a change in bodily self-image that precedes switching because switching is experienced it more uh, mostly as bodily. When you ask the borderline and the narcissist how they experience switching, they typically would describe uh, changes in their bodies, not in their mind. As far as they're concerned, they're the same person. Nothing has changed with their minds. The minds are the same. Something has happened to their bodies. So they somatize the switching. Next is a dramatic, but a seriously radical extreme change in identity. Suddenly behaviors change, preferences change, values change, beliefs change. Uh, there's over emotionality. There, there's a, a, a transformed cognitive style, unrecognizable cognitive style, and so on and so forth. When you see a new personality emerging that has literally nothing to do with the previous personality, when you see a new identity coalescing where no identity has preceded it or another identity has preceded it, which doesn't share anything with a new one, there's no common denominator. It's as if a new person is born in front of your eyes, fully formed, with new, new ideals, new values, new hopes, new dreams, new wishes, new beliefs, new commitments, new behaviors, and so on and so forth. When there is such a massive transition, these are self-states. What you're witnessing is switching. Now, of course, this is most expressible and manifest in multiple personality and dissociative identity disorder. Not all, not all DIDs, not all forms of DID. But in the extreme forms of the idea, this is most manifest. But anyone who has witnessed a borderline transition uh, or switch, anyone who, is not, who, is, uh, who has been the unfortunate observer uh, of a switching event in a narcissist can tell you that it is no less dramatic, no less dramatic than the most dramatic switches in DID, in multiple personality. Absolutely no less dramatic. The changes in the borderline and in the narcissist when they switch from one self state to another are equivalent, or they have the same potency and intensity as switching in DID, in dissociative identity disorder. Um, now, this is usually followed by a phase of talkativity, hyperverbalizing, which is essentially a psychotic feature. Talkativity, hyperreflexivity, there is a huge confusion between external objects and internal objects. And this leads, for example, to extreme paranoia because events, uh, objects that are interacting inside your mind are perceived as external and vice versa. External objects are perceived as internal. When the narcissist and the borderline switch, the borders, the boundaries between internal and external inside and outside, here and there, me and the world, these boundaries dissolve. They don't become fuzzy or blurred, they dissolve. And this is known as hyperreflexivity. And coupled with hyperverbalizing, talkativity, uh, this is extremely reminiscent of schizophrenia. Extremely reminiscent. Schizophrenia, we have what is known colloquially as the word salad. It's disorganized speech. And this, is, this happens in uh, switching. This phase is usually short, but doesn't have to be. Could last for a few days, but typically is more like, you know, a few minutes to a few hours. And this psychotic phase, essentially it's psychosis. This psychotic phase, known as a psychotic micro episode, this micro psychotic state or pseudo psychotic state is followed by a period of subdued, slow motion, hesitant reactivity. It's very reminiscent of waking up from a dream. It's as if they're having switched from one self-state to another, the borderline and the narcissist are waking up into the reality of the new self-state. The previous self-state is now perceived as some kind of nightmare, some kind of dream from which the narcissist and borderline have awakened. So there's the new state, new self-state takes over, but there is this transition which is, again, the equivalent of waking up. 
having transitioned fully to the new state self state there is impulsivity there is pronounced impulsivity acting on impulse recklessly it's as if the narcissist, the narcissist or borderline are testing the limits the capacities the potency the abilities of the new self state let's see what you can do let's see how far we can take it they're testing the new self state the same way they're testing intimate partners because exactly like an intimate partner it's an internal object so they are abusing the new self state they're putting it to the to the test by misbehaving uh, they're actually creating adverse condi conditions which the self state has to cope with and somehow ameliorate mitigate and solve so there is a period of impulsivity and, and recklessness which are reminiscent of psychopathy as you can see switching involves a tour across multiple mental health uh, disorders so it's like the borderline and the narcissist kaleid kaleidoscopically transition between psychosis and psychopathy and <laughs> they are kind of all over the place in terms of mental health diagnosis which makes switching exceedingly difficult to capture in clinical rigid clinical terms it's it's a flux it's a situation of flux and finally the last stage of switching is dissociation the narcissist and the borderline dissociate the previous self-state away delete it eliminate it forget it this creates a memory gap this creates lost time the narcissist compensates for this by confabulating the borderline compensates for this by denying that there are memory gaps and so on by feeling guilty by developing paranoia self-directed paranoia she doesn't know what she may have done uh, during the lost time and by relying on any an, an external partner on an intimate partner to regulate herself and her memory dissociation usually is the last phase and the narcissist and the borderline settle into the new self-state now the new self-state could last hours days months years even decades there's no telling it all depends again on a variety of triggers stimuli provocations events people behaviors of people choices and decisions of others and so on and so forth they're going to trigger perhaps the next switching event and maybe not so narcissists and borderlines are regulated from the outside they are utterly responsive to the environment they're creatures of the environment everything that's happening inside them including switching is in 90 percent of the cases um, an, an import they are importing stimuli and so on and reacting to it uh, there are some signs in uh, switching that you can perhaps can, can, perhaps can be of help to you uh, uh, muscle twitching confusion slow heavy blinking memory loss headache clearing the throat repeatedly changing the pitch of voice changing vocabulary different temperament different functional abilities or skills lack of eye contact and changes to the eye itself not black eye and all this bullshit but changes for example dilated pupils and so on change in handwriting appearing spaced out adjusting clothing totally different wardrobe and sartorial fashion preferences and changing posture these are all external visible so there's an article about emotional switching in borderline in the literature in the description of this video so be alert be attuned to your borderline or narciss narcissist partner the switching is an inevitable and oft oft recurring situation in both narcissism and borderline you can't avoid it if you're the narcissist or borderline's partner you are going to be exposed to multiple events of switching in your partner 
And you better be prepared for them. You better be able to identify when this is happening, the warning signs, the prodromal stage, and prepare yourself. Switching implies that your partner has changed in very fundamental ways. And you need to change equally. You need to somehow accommodate this new version of your partner in order to not create adverse situations and problems and worse. So the partner switching forces you in a way to switch. Identity disturbance is therefore a, a bit contagious as you need to adapt your identity to your partner's new identity. It's very disconcerting because sometimes the switching is so radical and so dramatic and so extreme that you feel that you're in the presence of someone you've never met. And this could last, you know, as I said, could last for months or years. Although in the vast majority of cases, it lasts only for hours or days, luckily for everyone involved. But there's no guarantee that the next switching, the next switch would lead the borderline and the narcissist back to the original. So you have met a narcissist, you've met a borderline, you create a relationship with them, you form a relationship with them, as a friend, as an intimate partner, whatever. And then they switch. And they switch from self-state one, with, with which you have created the relationship, they switch from self-state one to self-state two. And you say to yourself, okay, right now they have switched, from self-state one to self-state two, if I wait long enough and I'm patient and adaptable, and if I, if I accommodate them, if, if I don't engage in conflict, and so on and so forth, they're going to switch from self-state two back to self-state one. No, there's no guarantee of this. They can as easily and as likely switch from self-state one to self-state three. From self-state two to self-state three you may end up having to cope with 20 or 30 or 40 versions of your borderline analysis throughout your time together. Perhaps this is the most difficult task to accept that your intimate partner, the narcissist or the borderline, there's nobody there. It's a kaleidoscope. It's a mirror. Re a reflective mirror. It's, there's no core there's no identity, there's no person, there's no self. You're not interacting with someone. You're interacting with an assembly, a troupe, a theater troupe, uh, the cast of a film. And you need to be in flux in order to remain with this kind of path. Because if you are rigid, and if you are unitary, and if you do have a core, and if you insist on it, uh, your relationship is going to be very short-lived. In a way, the borderline and the narcissist force you to flow, to evolve, to change, to switch, to become someone else every now and again. On the one hand, it's an exhilarating, fascinating experience. On the other hand, it could be very disorienting and disconcerting and frightening. Even. It's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. And here, I will switch you off.